thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And uh, actually, I was a bit surprised and honored uh, to be invited because I am a newbie in this area. Um, I was introduced to the microbiome world a couple of years ago uh, when I became involved in a research consortium led by Jeff Gordon at Washington University uh, in St. Louis uh, called the Breast Milk Gut Microbiome and Immunity Project. And, and my part in that consortium is really because of work that I've been involved in in Africa with child malnutrition. And so I've had to kind of do a crash course in the microbiome field in order to prepare for this presentation. So I hope that my colleagues in the audience who uh, know more about some of this than I do will chip in uh, during the discussion. Um, now, I myself work at the far end of the translational spectrum when it comes to my research. So I'm involved in human population research um, in communities. And I'm, I, I hope that the discussion uh, today and tomorrow can lead us even further in the direction of linking the very exciting work that we've seen presented today at the basic level to uh, its translation into application in the field. And for many different types of populations, we've just heard about the elderly, and I'm going to talk about the other end of the age spectrum. Uh, just one last thing to say about my background, I was originally trained, uh, trained as an ecologist, and so for me it's really delightful to see the human body now viewed as an ecosystem. And I only wish that more MDs would see it that way. So when thinking about um, what to review for this presentation, I think that the key questions in my mind were, how uh, does diet in early life influence the microbiome? How does the microbiome influence child nutritional status? And how do differences in microbiome structure and function affect nutritional outcomes during the first two to three years of life, as well as long-term health and developmental outcomes? And uh, what I was able to find was really very scant and really almost nothing on the third question listed there. So I'm going to um, start first with something you all know. We've heard a couple times previously that the, be the beginning stage for the infant is uh, theoretically at least an, a sterile environment in the infant intestine, um, and that various factors then influence the uh, individual's gut microbiotic composition thereafter, including gestational age, delivery mode, maternity ward or neonatal clinic, uh, feeding mode, other foods and fluids, antibiotic use, paternal skin and the skin of other caregivers, and the environment. And uh, this study shown in, in this slide has also been referred to before, but I, I want to mention it again for one specific reason. Um, this was the cross-cultural study done by uh, Yatsunenko and colleagues published last year in which they characterized bacterial species present in fecal samples from three very different populations around the world. And they were able to show that the um, differences between uh, the younger um, profiles and the adults um, narrowed with age. So you can see that uh, in all three of the populations, the children were quite, quite different from the adults and then um, achieved more or less the adult type by about three years of age. So the first three years of life are a period of very rapid transformation of the microbiota and uh, an important period in life for us to focus on. In that same study, um, they were able to show that uh, this fundamental sort of change that occurs in the first couple of lives, a uh, couple of years of life, is in the diversity in um, the microbiota. Uh, and if you look at that blown up over here in all three of the populations, um, that was the trend between zero and three years of age. Now, of course, the very first diet that we hope the infant will receive is breast milk. And this plays a fundamental role in influencing the infant's microbiome. And I'm going to talk about three aspects to that. First of all, there are microbes in breast milk that have been hypothesized to seed the infant's GI tract. There are many, many constituents in human milk um, that are considered prebiotic uh, that are very important at promoting the growth of certain types of bacteria. And there are quite dramatic differences in the microbiome between breastfed and formula-fed infants. 
So starting with the first one, um, I'm just going to show you this one study by um, Cabrera Rubio et al. Uh, in which they characterized the milk micro microbial community for 18 lactating women within two days of childbirth and then again at one and six months postpartum. Now they found several hundred species of bacteria uh, and, uh, or that they suspect there are several hundred species and that these are compositionally distinct from other human niches and they conclude that they are not simply contaminants from the skin. Um, they found that colostrum has a higher microbial diversity than transitional or mature, mature milk. And in the colostrum samples, the dominant um, types of bacteria are shown here and that by one and six months, the typical inhabitants of the oral cavity became um, more prevalent in the milk and they speculated that this was due to bacteria from the infant's mouth colonizing the milk ducts and the areola. Interestingly, they found that milk from obese mothers tended to contain a different and less diverse bacterial community compared to milk from normal weight mothers. And they also found that milk samples from mothers who went through elective but not non-elective C-section contained a different bacterial community than the milk samples from mothers with a vaginal delivery. Because it was only seen in the mothers with elective C-section, they concluded that it was the process of at least going through some labor, the physiological stress of that, um, that linked the mothers with vaginal delivery and the non-elective C-sections in having some commonality in their micro, uh, microflora in the, in the milk. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the prebiotics in human milk because you're going to hear a wonderful lecture tomorrow by my colleague David Mills. Uh, and I am showing just one slide from uh, one of their papers recently published um, characterizing the, uh, some of the prebiotics in human milk, um, particularly the human milk oligosaccharides and um, glycocongenates uh, that are quite diverse, many, many, many different types of these that are um, very abundant in human milk and pretty unique to human milk uh, and are known to be utilized especially by bifidobacteria. Um, so this is a, a structural um, example of a human milk oligosaccharide. These are some of the other uh, glycans um, of different types and over here a glycolipid. And David will explain to you uh, how all of those are uh, operating in terms of their impact on the microflora. So as a result of some of these uh, differences in the experience between breastfed and non-breastfed infants, um, there are differences in the microbiome by feeding mode, but the results from different studies are actually somewhat mixed. I'm just showing two examples here. This is a, a study of a fairly large sample of more than 600 uh, from uh, European countries, uh, which found that bifidobacteria dominated the microbiota of the breastfed infants, whereas the formula-fed infants had higher proportions of bacteroides and members of the Clostridium uh, coccoides and lactobacillus groups. Um, in this study, which is much smaller, um, they found that formula-fed infants had increased richness of species with overrepresentation of um, Clostridium difficile, but no difference in bifidobacteria compared to breastfed infants. So there has been some mixture in findings, uh, and there was a review conducted a few years back that contrasted the studies done uh, before 1980 and after 1980 um, with the purpose of, of making the point that methodological uh, differences as well as differences perhaps in the definition of breastfeeding um, and how uh, subjects were categorized may have led to differences in some of the findings. So, uh, for example, here in the bifidobacteria line, you can see before 1980, uh, five out of six studies found those were increased in the breastfed infants, but after 1980, that was not as commonly demonstrated. On the other hand, there are other uh, types uh, over here that are lower in the breastfed infants, um, and that's fairly consistently found, including Bacteroides and Clostridia. So I think that uh, we don't fully understand all these differences, but certainly there are differences in microbial uh, composition in the gut by feeding mode. Now to straighten out some of, these, um, some of this confusion, I thought it might be helpful to look at one uh, study from an animal model, in this case a primate, um, which is very close to humans. This was just recently published. 
Um, and in this case, they looked at rhesus monkey infants who were randomized to receive uh, breast milk from their mothers or formula exclusively from birth to three months of age. It's a small sample. When you're working with monkeys, that's the way it is. Um, but the value of this particular model is that nutritional needs of uh, rhesus monkeys are actually quite similar to those of human infants. And they found that the formula-fed monkeys had more rapid growth and higher serum insulin. That's also true in human infants who are formula-fed. Uh, and they had higher levels of bacteria from the ruminococcus genus and lower levels uh, from lactobacillus genus. And along with these differences, they found elevated levels of many uh, cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors at four weeks of age. So in addition to characterizing the microbiome in this study, they also did um, metabolomics work. And you can see here, I'm not going to go into the details, but that there's quite dramatic separation uh, in both serum and urine in um, the profiles that they were able to find. So this uh, difference between receiving breast milk or receiving formula has fundamental effects on the child's metabolism. So the next phase in terms of what the uh, infant would experience would be the introduction of solid foods, and this also uh, plays a role in the changes that occur in the microbiome. Um, this was a study I mentioned before from Europe in which they assessed the fecal microbiota composition of infants from five different countries. They sampled them at six weeks of age uh, before any solid foods were introduced, and again four weeks after the introduction of solid foods. Um, and in this uh, particular set of infants, 59% were fully breastfed, 27% fully formula fed, and 14% were mixed fed at baseline. You can see in this slide that after solid foods were introduced, there was a reduction in bifidobacteria, um, as well as in some of the Clostridia species, uh, and in the enterobacteria here. And there was an increase uh, in a couple of uh, other species of Clostridia. So that shift uh, makes a difference. What we don't know is what happens in, when you give different types or different composition of solid foods, and that's been uninvestigated to the best of my knowledge. The other study I wanted to mention along these lines is one from um, De Filippo et al., and this was mentioned in an earlier presentation today. Uh, and in this case, they contrasted the gut microbiota of children in Burkina Faso in West Africa and children in Europe. And they found that the uh, composition of the microflora diverged after weaning. In both populations, breastfeeding was fairly common in very early life. And uh, when they started receiving other foods, they received very different types of diets. So in the Burkinabi diet, this was low in fat and animal protein, rich in starch, fiber, and plant polysaccharides, and predominantly vegetarian. The European diet being higher in fat, animal protein, sugar, and starch, and lower in fiber. Now I wanted to mention that this is an agricultural population here, so I would not consider this to be any kind of model diet, certainly not an ancestral diet, if you go back to more of the evolutionary past for humans. It's a cereal-based diet and nutritionally inadequate in many different ways. Um, so I don't want to give you the impression that this is um, a better diet than, than the European one in any way. Um, as I said, the differences in the microbiota became evident after the period of predominant breastfeeding. And at that point, they found higher microbial richness and biodiversity in the Burkina Faso samples. Um, they found a greater representation of actinobacteria and bacteroidetes, uh, and um, in contrast, in the European children, a greater abundance of firmicutes and proteobacteria. And this shows um, in color the very dramatic difference in the microbiota in these two populations. Uh, over here, very much dominated um, uh, by Prevotella and other bacteroidetes, and over here, you can see um, a lot more representation of the ones in this area here. Now there were some other correlates to these differences in the microbiota. In the uh, Burkinabi children, they had greater uh, total short chain fatty acids in fecal samples. We just heard about the importance of short chain fatty acids um, that are produced um, or uh, during fermentation by intestinal microbiota. Uh, based on plant polysaccharides. Um, these substances are very important precursors for many things that are uh, potentially have health outcomes, 
and have been theorized to prevent the establishment of potentially pathogenic intestinal microbes and have a role against gut inflammation. In this particular situation, I'm not sure we could argue that the uh, Burkinabi children uh, were protected against um, some of these pathogenic microbes because diarrhea rates and other illnesses are very, very common there. I want to move on to think about specific nutrients because a lot of times when people think about nutrition and the microbiota, they're thinking in very general terms about total protein, total fat, carbohydrates, maybe fiber, but they're really not thinking very often about micronutrients. And in nutrition, we think about the, the huge number of different nutrients that um, we think about every day. There's probably 40 or more nutrients that we might consider. Um, there's very, very little in the literature on the specific nutrients and how they might interact with the microbiota. I'm actually just going to mention two that I could find studies related to, and one is iron and the other is fatty acids. In the case of iron, this is an important one to consider because it's an essential nutrient for many gut microbes, um, but some of the beneficial barrier bacteria, uh, in particular lactobacilli, do not require iron. So when you introduce iron into the diet in large amounts, you can shift the profile of the bacteria in the gut. And in particular, for some enteric gram-negative bacteria, um, and some of these are pathogens, iron acquisition plays an essential role in the virulence and colonization of the pathogenic strains. With regard to fatty acids, there's just uh, very little information, but suggesting that the omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids may modulate growth and adhesion of lactobacilli and may impair the growth of um, certain species of bacteroides. So I wanted to show you one um, important study. It was published just recently by Nancy Krebs and her group in Colorado, uh, looking at effects of different complementary feeding regimens on iron status and enteric microbiota in breastfed infants. In this case, it was a randomized trial with four to five, 45 exclusively breastfed five-month-old infants randomized to one of three feeding groups, either commercially available pureed meats iron and zinc fortified infant cereals or iron only fortified infant cereals. And they followed them until nine to 10 months of age. And in the last 14 infants in the study, they were able to get samples to characterize the enteric microbiome. Uh, and they got fecal samples monthly between five and nine months. One of the important aspects of this study is that the cereal groups had much higher iron intake than the meat group. And that's shown here in this slide uh, um, right here is the iron and zinc fortified cereal, this is the iron only fortified cereal, and this is the meat group. This is dietary iron between six and nine months of age. You can see a huge jump uh, with both of the fortified cereals and a much smaller increase in dietary iron in the meat group. Concomitantly with that, they found differences in the microflora in this relatively small sample of infants, but only in the iron only fortified group. So in that case, they had a reduction here in the actinobacteria, uh, and they had an uh, increase in the bacteroidetes, a decrease over here in the lactobacilli, and uh, the only difference that the meat group showed was an increase in uh, clostridia group uh, acclade uh, in this particular case. Uh, so these are, I would say, probably fairly preliminary data showing that the um, type of complementary food, and in particular the iron content of that food, could actually make quite a large difference in the microflora. To um, illustrate that point further, I have one slide from an older age group. This was conducted in uh, school-age children in uh, Cote d'Ivoire in Africa by Michael Zimmerman and his group. This was a double-blind randomized controlled trial in which they received either an iron-fortified or a non-fortified biscuit for six months. And those biscuits contain 20 milligrams of iron per day, given four times per week as electrolytic iron. When they looked at the um, gut microflora, they did not find a significant difference in the bifidobacteria. This is the control group at baseline at six months, iron at baseline and at six months. But they found an increase in the iron group in enterobacteria, uh, a decrease in lactobacilli, and along with those changes in the flora, they found quite a large increase in a marker of gut inflammation, which is fecal calprotectin. So there are some concerns that providing iron um, may shift 
the flora in such a way that it may be uh, disadvantageous to the child. Uh, with that said, maybe I should back up for just a second and say that um, we, we worry about iron a lot because iron deficiency is probably the most common nutritional disorder in the world. And we uh, estimate probably about 50% of young children are iron deficient and uh, similarly a very large percentage of pregnant women globally in low-income countries. And so that's why fortified products are um, one of the strategies being used to um, reduce iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. But we need to be concerned about whether there are potential side effects from those kinds of strategies. Now, as I mentioned, the other uh, nutrient I could find some information about were fatty acids. And this is just one study I found on the effect of fish oil supplements on fecal microbiota from 9 to 18 months. Uh, this was conducted in uh, Denmark with 132 healthy infants. Uh, and they were um, looking at molecular fingerprints of bacterial DNA. Uh, and so they were characterizing the outcomes here in terms of um, sort of general types. I don't have genus, uh, but these were, both of these particular um, categories were presumed to be bacteroidetes, and they were modified um, by the breastfeeding status of the child. So what they found is that um, in those who were not breastfed at baseline at nine months, there was a greater increase in one of these types in the fish oil group and a greater increase in the other type in the sunflower oil group. It's a little bit hard to interpret what that means in terms of potential health consequences, um, but what it does mean is that the fatty acid composition of the diet can um, cause shifts in the microflora in the infant's gut. Now switching to the second way of looking at this, how does the microbiome influence the child's nutritional status, I'm going to um, mention a study that has also been mentioned by previous speakers, uh, just published in Science this year in which the gut microbiomes of Malawian twin pairs uh, discordant for a form of severe malnutrition called kwashiorkor were uh, compared. And in the study, they compared um, or they examined 317 twin pairs that were followed through the th first three years of life. Uh, and in this case, 50% of the twin pairs did not develop acute malnutrition. 43% became discordant, which means one twin, pair of the, twin of the pair did and the other did not. Um, and 7% um, both developed acute malnutrition. Whenever one or both of the members of the twin pair developed malnutrition, they were both treated with uh, therapeutic food, a peanut-based ready-to-use therapeutic food. And so in this study, they assessed the microbiomes of nine same-gender twin pairs without malnutrition and 13 pairs discordant for kwashiorkor. And in this slide, um, they were able to show that the microbiomes of the twins with Kashiroko were less mature compared to their non-malnourished co-twins. So these are the co-twins who remained non-malnourished. I don't personally call them healthy, because in that environment, uh, that's the exception rather than the rule, but they didn't meet the definition of severe malnutrition. And you can see that uh, there's an increase over time in the um, uh, diversity uh, of the microbiome, and in the healthy co-twin of the pair where one of them developed kwashiorkor, that same sort of trend was exhibited, but in the twin with kwashiorkor, um, there was a transient increase in maturity when they received the RUTF, but that was not sustained, so they ended up not really having that same temporal maturation as their co-twin. And as you know, in this study, they were able to take the fecal samples from these pairs of twins and implant them into notobiotic mice. And I won't go over again um, how that method uh, works. I think most of you here are familiar with it. But I do want to show a slide that's been shown before just to reiterate that, um, in fact, the results they found in the mice who were recipients of these uh, microbial transplants uh, exhibited the, the phenotype of losing weight only when they were on the Malawian diet. And this slide doesn't show that when they were on a control mouse chow, they did not exhibit a phenotypic difference. So there is a diet um, microbiome interaction. And I think it's very important for all of us here to remember um, when thinking about uh, consequences. So here's the group that got the um, 
transplant from the twin with Kwashiorkor, uh, and then this is from the co-twin that did not develop Kwashiorkor. And you can see that these mice lost weight during that period of time. They recovered that during the period of feeding with RUTF, but then did not really uh, sustain that uh, weight gain over time. And similar profile was seen in the fecal microbiota, um, very dramatic um, reconfiguration during the period of refeeding with RUTF, um, but then became more similar to the, the co-twin thereafter. Now, in terms of the types of uh, species and taxa that changed, um, when the mouse received uh, the microbiota from the Kwashiorkor twin, uh, there were increases in certain types of uh, bacteria and decreases in others. Um, and some of the taxa also changed in the mice that got the healthy uh, co-twin transplant. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can just see visually that um, this is the period during the Malawia diet. This is on RUTF. Now you see a lot of changes occurring, and this is back on the Malawi diet over here. So where do we go from here? Um, this is uh, really what, what drew me into the field is the project that is attempting to bring together various disciplines to look at all of the relationships between the breast milk, gut microbiome, and immunity um, using populations in uh, populations with a lot of malnutrition. Uh, and um, the goals of this project are to identify and validate new pre- and probiotic interventions to improve the health and development of infants and children in the developing world, and then demonstrate a process by which new such interventions can be identified and validated in the future. And the, the point here is that, as several people have mentioned before, it really requires lots of different disciplinary expertise to put this all together, to take the information uh, from the trials that have been done in humans, to then look at what uh, that means in animal models, to identify leads for pro, pre, pro, and symbiotics, then um, go back and test those in animals and eventually test those in human populations. So that's where we are aiming. I was asked to identify gaps, so this is my last slide. Just wanted to say that apart from the studies uh, comparing the breastfed and formula-fed infants, there's very little information on how dietary composition uh, or nutrient intake affects the microbiome of children. So I would very strongly urge uh, greater funding and, and research in that area. And then in terms of the emerging link between malnutrition and the microbiome, um, this is something that we need to understand much better in terms of what the causality uh, and the direction of that causality is, uh, as well as the uh, effect of different types of interventions. And lastly, uh, we really desperately need um, prospective studies that include long-term follow-up of intervention trials uh, to look at consequences later in life of these changes in early, uh, early childhood. I'd just like to finish by thanking the BMMI team that introduced me to this world and to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was excellent. Um, I'm going to take a moderator's um, privilege and ask one quick thing relative to the comparing or doing research in formula-fed babies versus breastfed babies, formulas that are now being enriched with probiotics at an increasing rate in, in the United States and prebiotics as well. And this has been a trend within the last five years or so. So there needs to be that caution to control for that. And it's going to be difficult to compare to historic studies because of that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think that part of the reason there's so much diversity in the findings of studies doing this is that formulas have changed dramatically over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. um, not even just the last five or 10 years, with a lot of different um, compositional changes. And so it's very difficult to compare uh, across time, as you say. Thank you. Hi. It, you may have said this. It went by kind of fast. but. For the case of bacteria in mother's milk and appearance of those lineages in babies, uh, what's, the, what's the overview of studies on that? reason I ask, we did a study with Grace Aldravandi where we tracked OTUs in mother's milk and OTUs in baby poop, and we really didn't see any uh, uh, linkage between the two. Baby's poop was no more similar to their own mother's milk than somebody else's mother's milk and vice versa. And I was wondering what the, what the line of studies is on that. 
Well, I think you probably know better than I do. I mean, I, I don't believe the study that I was mentioning um, tried to look at how the microbes in, in the mother's milk were related to the infant's microflora. And I think that's a good point. If it is seeding the gut, is that really uh, contributing to the growth of bacteria in the infant over time? So I think it's an open question, unless somebody else wants to answer so that. With, with regard to the microbes in mother's milk, I mean, yeah, I mean how, how is, is there a sort of special organ that cultivates the microbes, or is, is it just sort of distributed throughout the gland? I mean, it seems to me like this is some sort of ev evolutionary um, divert, I mean, it's some, some need to have these microbes in there, and yet nobody actually talks about what's maintaining them and how they're actually kept in the breast and how they accumulate. Where do they come from originally? Is it, is it sort of spores that are there all life and suddenly wake up later? I mean, any ideas on that? <laughs> Well, those are great questions. I mean, I can only speculate that, that there is a portal to the outside world uh, even before the mammary gland starts to lactate. That, right, but once they get inside at least the ducts, then they have this wonderful food uh, to start flourishing on, which is not present on the skin or in other parts of the body. So I'm just speculating here. If anybody wants to, to jump in, um, please go ahead. But those are great questions. Thank you. Let's, let's give another round of applause to Catherine. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker for this session, Dr. Johanna Lampe from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And she's going to talk about gut microbial metabolism of food constituents modulating human dietary exposure. <laughs> 